Welcome to the CISSP Cyber Training Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need to pass the CISSP exam the first time. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast. Join me each week as I provide the information you need to pass the CISSP exam and grow your cybersecurity knowledge. All right, let's get started. Let's go. Hey, I'm Sean Gerber with CISSP Cyber Training, and I hope you all are having a wonderful day today. Today is exam question Thursday, and we're going to go over questions that would be associated with domain 8.1, and that's where we get into libraries, IDEs, compilers, and object-oriented programming. So these questions you may or may not see, but the bottom line, like we talk about with the CISSP and studying for the exam questions is understanding the management thought process behind it. Again, there's plenty of technical aspects out there where you want to learn these things, but when it comes right down to the CISSP, you want to be able to take, understand the exam questions in a way that will allow you to understand how the manager thinks and then how should you react. So let's go ahead and get started right into them right now. Question one. Alice is a developer tasked with using libraries to enhance security. Why is it crucial for Alice to use well-vetted libraries? A, to ensure cohesion. B, to avoid licensing issues. C, to increase assurance levels. Or D, to facilitate error handling. Again, Alice is a developer used with libraries that are to enhance security. Why is it crucial for Alice to use well-vetted libraries? And the answer is C, to increase your assurance level. By using well-vetted libraries, you can increase the assurance of the software that it is secure and it is reliable. You know, know that if you've got libraries from places that are not known, you don't know what might be in them. So it's, it is a risk that when you are a developer and you're utilizing libraries from third parties, make sure you're getting them from a trusted and reliable source. Question two, Bob is deciding on a development tool set for his team. What should Bob primarily be considered with for ensuring security? A, cost effectiveness, B, user friendliness, C, vendor reputation, or D, secure coding features. Again, Bob is deciding on a development team tool set for his team. What should be his primary consideration for ensuring security? And it is D, secure coding features, right? A tool set with secure coding features does help the development team produce more secure applications. Question three, Carol is a developer using object-oriented programming, otherwise called as OOP, O-O-P. What term describes the feature where subclass inherits methods and properties from a superclass? Okay, so basically it's inheriting, right? For a subclass is inheriting the methods and properties from a superclass. If you don't really understand all the wording, again, understand just what is the concept behind the overall question. Inherit, it inherits. Focus on that key word. A is polymorphism. B is cohesion. C is inheritance. Or D is coupling. And the answer is C, inheritance, right? Because you see that word in the actual question itself. But bottom line is you're trying to understand what are they getting by with the question. You could say inherits. It could use a different word than inherits, but the ultimate goal is that it's following the same pattern. And inheritance allows a subclass to inherit methods and properties from the superclass and by facilitating code reuse and its overall modular design. Question four, Dave has a responsibility for establishing assurance levels for a new application. What does a higher assurance level signify? A, a lower development cost, B, greater confidence and security, C, more features, or D, faster performance. Dave's is responsible for establishing assurance levels for a new application. What does a higher assurance level signify? And the Answer is B, greater confidence in the security. Again, assurance, you want to th think of that English word as providing better, greater feeling feeling about it. It's, it's giving you a set of confidence about it. So it's, again, B is higher assurance levels will indicate greater confidence in the security and reliability of the application. Question five, Emily is responsible for system reliability. What is her primary tool for avoiding system failures? A, frequent updates, B, backup power supply, C, redundancy, or D, strong authentication. 
Okay, so she's responsible for system reliability. Focus on that word, right? And now you're going to get into C, redundancy. Redundancy can provide a safety net for all these systems in the event that they fail. And it's important to have that in place, especially when you're having backup systems that potentially could take over in case of total failure. Question six, Frank is implementing an authentication and session management for a web application. What should be Frank's top priority? Okay, so Frank is implementing authentication and session management, okay, for a web application. So he's putting those together for this specific web app. A, session timeout. B, two-factor authentication. C, compl password complexity. All of those are important for a web application. Or D, all of the above. Yes, it is D, all of the above. Each one of those is a crucial and effective part of a web application. So you should ensure that they're done. They're, they're added to his overall plan. Question seven, Grace is in charge of error handling in her application. What should Grace avoid displaying in error messages to end users? Okay, this is one of the security 101 things, right? You want to avoid error messages. A, general information about the error. B, stack traces. C, contact details for support, or D, suggestions for resolving the error. Okay, so this is something that you may go, well, there's other questions in here that sound really good. But when it comes right down to it, what is it when we're dealing with error handling in the application, what should be avoided when Grace does this? And it should be stack traces. B, these can reveal sensitive information about the system and it could be exploited. Now, obviously contact support, and suggestions for resolving the error and general information about the error. Yeah, those, those would be valuable, but a stack trace will give you much more detailed information than what you really want to display. So therefore, it's important that you consider that when you are having error messages displayed. Question eight, Henry is developing an object-oriented application. Which term describes the feature where objects can be take, more, take on more than one form? Harry's developing an object-oriented application, OOP, which term describes the feature where objects can take on more than one form? Okay, so think about the words, and they can take on more than one form. A, polymorphism. B, cohesion. C, inheritance. Or D, coupling. So if you look at those words, as we talked about in the podcast, we talked about cohesion, inheritance, and polymorphism. We didn't really talk about coupling, but that doesn't mean it's not part of it. So what one could it be? Well, what is polymorphism? That allows an object to be treated in instances of their parent class. So it allows them to take more than one form. This leads to simpler code and fewer errors. And so the answer would be A, okay? Polymorphism that can take on more than one form. Question nine, Irene is reviewing her code for quality. What quality should Irene aim for in terms of cohesion and coupling? Irene review their code for quality. What quality should Irene aim for in terms of cohesion and coupling? So when you're dealing with A, high cohesion, high coupling. B, low cohesion, low coupling. C, high cohesion, low coupling. Or D, low cohesion, high coupling. Okay, so it basically goes into the, all the various permutations of high and low. So which one is it? Well, when we're dealing with overall co terms of cohesion and coupling, the answer would be C. High cohesion within the modules and low coupling between the modules make the system easier to understand, modify, and maintain. So break it down. High cohesion, what does that word mean? You're talking things connecting together. And then as far as low coupling would basically mean you have low barriers to that entry. So therefore, high cohesion, low coupling would be the answer. Question 10, Jack is developing an object-oriented program that needs to be distribute tax amongst objects. What term describes the act of an object in an OOP delegating a task to another object? Okay, again, what is the key terms that you're trying to get out of that? Delegating, we talked about that in the podcast. A, inheritance. B, delegating. C, polymorphism. Or D, coupling. And the answer obviously is D, delegating, right? Delegating refers to the act of an object passing a task to another object, thereby distributing its responsibilities to that other object. Question 11, Karen needs to produce a software component with a high level of assurance. What should Karen prioritize? A, quick development cycle. 
B, thorough testing, C, low cost, or D, resource availability. Again, Karen needs to produce a software component with a high level of assurance. What should she prioritize? Well, if it's a high level of assurance, you, you wanna make sure that it works. So if you wanna make sure that it works, you want to make sure you do thorough testing. This is important when you have high assurance levels. If you didn't have to have that assurance level, you may want the quick development cycle just to get it done. Or you may have low cost depending upon what your budget might be. But in reality, if you didn't have that high assurance, most likely you'd wanna to try to get it through as fast as you possibly can and then work out the bugs later. Luke is learning about the instances of object-oriented programming. What is an instance of OOP? A, a method within a class. B, an individual object of a class. C, a parent class. Or D, a specialized form of a class. So this one here, you'd be like, I have no idea, right? Well, the point of it is, is that you're trying to understand, what do we talk about? We talk about individual objects are an important factor of OOP and how they relate to a specific class. So just keep in mind that an instance of an OOP is an individual object, right, created from the overall class. So we kind of talked about that briefly in the podcast itself. But again, an individual object is created from a class and that's when you're dealing with object-oriented programming. Okay, question 13. Nancy is writing with methods for her classes in object-oriented programming. What methods represent OOP? A, data held by an object. B, behavior of an object. C, relationship between objects. Or D, object categories. She's writing her classes in object-oriented programming. What methods represent OOP? behavior of an object? The answer B, methods define the behavior or functionality of an object that is within the specific class. So again, class, object, and then your overall behavior or functionality is the next. Question 14, Olivia is tasked with ensuring secure session management for her application. What is a crucial, what is crucial for se secure session management? A, session fixation protection. B, session timeout. C, encryption of the session data, or D, all of the above. Okay, so she's ensuring secure session management. So she needs to secure that overall session management of the application. And that's the, the communication piece that it does. When you open up the browser, that's the session. It wants to ensure that we have secure management of that. And each one of those, A, B, and C, are all an important factor when you're dealing with secure session management. So it would be D, all of the above because they're very important when you're dealing with it and protecting against all the different types of a session type or related attacks. Question 15, and the last question or the last melon. You probably don't get the reference because I'm really old. It's called Ice Age. Yeah, it was always the last melon. All right, question 15, Paul needs to mitigate the risk of system failure for critical applications. What should be the first step? So he needs to mitigate the risk of system failure for a critical application. A, implement a robust backup solution. B, conduct a risk assessment. C, introduce a failover system. Or D, purchase insurance for data loss. So you need to understand, is it really critical? And how you would do that would be conducting a risk assessment. You conduct a risk assessment. This will help determine what types of failures are most likely and what would the impact be in the event that something bad were to happen. All right, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you guys have a blessed day. It's a great day here in Wichita, Kansas. Can't beat it at all. And uh, you hope to have a great day. We'll catch you next week. Catch you on the flip side. See ya.